Hey there, Matt. Hey, Seb. How's it going? It's going quite well. I'm glad we yeah. could uh, get our clocks coordinated finally. Clocks and calendars <laughs> off way off. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Well played, my friend. Well played. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing this morning? Or this after, morning? Uh, evening, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's six o'clock and we know, you know, the clock was moved, so it's still sunny outside. And it's been very, very sunny, very warm these days. Uh, all in all, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, pretty well. I'm having a slight headache today for some reason, but uh, aside from that, that's that basically it. Yeah. And uh, how are are you still pretty much quarantined, or are things? How what's the virus situation like there? Actually, it has uh, gotten worse. So we've just started uh, with uh, another bout or session of uh, quarantine. So we've been uh, locked down again um, uh, over the, the holidays now because the, the numbers have been soaring both, both in Slovenia and in the neighboring countries. Uh, so uh, apparently uh, we're in the middle of the, or at least maybe not in the middle, at, at the beginning of the third wave. So uh, things have taken a, a turn for the worse i would say um and people are just really really fed up with the lockdowns and everything they would like to get back to normal whatever normal is um and i, I just you know i just wonder how how this will pan out you know i'm just curious to see um uh, yeah no i i had been reading about Western Europe, and I wasn't sure how things were going in Eastern Europe and Central Europe yeah. you know, with, with regard to that next wave. Um, the U.S. is doing significantly better, but you know it may just be a matter of time before the next wave comes because people were already lax enough in a lot of the uh, you know especially the southern states, and now it's like they don't even pretend to care about wearing masks or distancing, and so even with the vaccine rollout going reasonably well here, um, we, we still only have about a quarter of the population vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, which is not enough for, you know, anything like herd immunity. So I would not be surprised if we have, it would be our fourth wave, I guess. <laughs> fourth but wave. Uh, so far right now, things are okay. Um, I'm actually yeah. gonna go see friends for the first time. Um, uh, in a week, I got my first vaccination, um, the wow. Moderna vaccine. So I'm a I'm a science project now. Um, <laughs> Marvelous. Marvelous. <laughs> so I should be 80% immune at this point, And then I get the other 15% after I get my second dose. So mm, okay. at least with the known variants, uh, who knows what future variants might emerge. I really hope yeah. we don't we don't need booster shots every year. Uh, you know, I'm not a yeah. vaccine skeptic necessarily, but I also but still right. I don't want to be having to you know in, inject new RNA into my system every year. That just seems. Yeah, kind of... I I agree with that. Uh, I'll probably be vaccinated in uh, a month or two, something like that. I'm not sure yet which of the vaccines I'll be getting. I. I would like to avoid the AstraZeneca one, if at all possible, uh, but I'll see. Um, but all in all, yeah, the, the, the numbers have been rising quite steeply in the neighboring country, countries as well. So uh, Czech Republic has been hit really bad and um, hung Hungary also. Uh, the numbers are also rising in uh, in Austria and Italy, and I heard that uh, France is going into another lockdown, and I think yeah. it will be, uh, what, three week or one month or something like that lockdown or even longer. See, the problem is, especially in France, it seems to uh, lockdown spur protests that defeat the purpose of the lockdown, <laughs> you know, so... But but you know this is the this is something that's been now happening throughout the Europe. Uh, for example, in 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 Germany, you had a similar situation, also to a lesser degree, admittedly here in Slovenia. But um, there have been protests also in Belgium, in the Netherlands. So you know, it's 
everywhere. That's precisely yeah. yeah the, the 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 issue that you mentioned is quite pertinent. You have these lockdowns, and then you have the protests, and then you wonder, you know, <laughs> uh, whether whether these protests do in fact kind of cancel out the the effect of the lockdowns. Yeah, you know, this is it, this is not um, unrelated to our you know, our topic yeah. that we wanted to discuss is I'm, I'm thinking about um, the relationship between scientific knowledge and human life uh, and how in our own day, there's an increased sense of disconnect between the knowledge of the experts and their prescriptions versus um, what many of the politicians wanna do, especially the more populist, um, right-wing populist, I guess, politicians in terms of their concern about the infringement of freedom and um, how dare we, how dare the scientists uh, try to get us to stop, you know, engaging in day-to-day -day life uh, just because of a small little virus that's only going to kill old people anyway, right? Which mm -hmm. turns out to not be not be true. And so, it, but I, I I feel like this this conflict between our knowledge, uh, supposed knowledge of nature and uh, on the other hand, our practice of everyday life are increasingly at odds with one another. And I mean, there are many things going wrong in this pandemic. Um, this split between science and, and society, if you will, seems to be one of them. Um, there's also the issue of the political economy underlying all of it. Um, but yeah, I think you know, what we wanted to talk about, given our, our shared interest in sort of the history of science and uh, 20th century, like late 19th, 20th, uh, early 20th century critiques of a certain kind of, say, scientific materialism, um, that that type of a metaphysical conversation is potentially quite relevant to how we sort through what's going on now in relationship to this virus. Do you think so? Yeah, I would say that, but, but it, I mean, like you've said, the, the current situation has brought out so many interesting, uh, pressing questions about the, the first of all, the, the relationship between science and society, as you said, um, but also about the nature of science to a certain degree mm -hmm. the main problem that i think in these types of debates is that they usually tend to boil down to you are either pro-science in an orthodox fashion like you know the, the the prototypical image of science or you're into some bizarre eccentric stuff so mm -hmm. there's this um strange dichotomy that emerges um and this is something that we see now in, uh, in in the current situation where you have people who are either completely pro-science or people who end up ex uh, endorsing these bizarre ideas that you don't know you know how basically people are able to come up with them uh, another telling example would be um the debate particularly in the united states um surrounding the nature of evolution so either you accept the prototypical darwinian story or you endorse some version some form of creationism mm -hmm. so tertium non datur so there is no middle way there is no possibility of you know uh reflecting on the nature of evolution maybe endorsing evolution but but debating the mechanisms of evolution the dynamics of evolution what it means and so on and so forth it so easily and quickly boils down to these two extremes and these two extremes are bad for many reasons because um on the one hand um this radically anti-science stance is i would say dangerous in so many different ways um, but it's also um, problematic because scientists themselves have the impression that or they can so it depends on the nature of the scientist but mm 
uh, they either have the impression that everybody who's critiquing science is into some weird stuff, or they have a very good justification as to why they don't really have to engage in any type of, uh, let's say, philosophical debate about the foundations of science, because eventually it boils down to, to some strange, fluffy, spooky stuff. So, as you've correctly stated, um, there are many very, very interesting debates about nature of science, dynamics of science, and there are many very interesting thinkers. And one of the reasons why you and I actually started these uh, discussions was uh, a shared interest in some of these uh, authors from the, like you said, from the, from the end of the 19th and the uh, first part of the 20th century, who were for the most part, very interested in science and pro-science in the broad sense of the term, but it also, they also realized that uh, there are certain philosophical underpinnings in the classical conception of science that might be problematic from bo for both um, uh, philosophical reasons and also in the sense that they might actually thwart the development and progress of science and its ability to explain the nature of reality, ourselves, and so on and so forth. Yeah, well said. Um, it's almost like I like to distinguish between capital S science, which has a certain authority um, for the educated public, um, and then lowercase s sciences, which are the plurality of different disciplines, each with um, really their own version of what gets called the scientific method. They have their own techniques, they have their own um, sort of criteria for what counts as evidence for what types of experiments can be done. They all have their own instruments. Uh, often it's not clear how these different scientific disciplines link up together to give us a complete picture of nature, you know, as it exists concretely um, mm -hmm. as a whole. And so whenever we talk about, you know, in, in the context of everyday human uh, society and politics and, and policy making and decision making, there's a tendency of like educated liberals, let's say, to just with the bumper sticker slogan kind of say, trust the scientist or trust science or when Trump was president, we had this huge protest um, in, in the US about uh, being pro-science, whether that's about climate change or uh, whatever the, the issue might be. And the idea seemed to be that if only we could put a bunch of scientists in charge, all of our political problems would be solved, right? And so this to me is, is, the, is a, it's the view of science as capital S science, as kind of a world view which in a way is a replacement for uh, the religious sort of cosmologies um, that prior to the modern period, human beings would live within, where everything from art to morality, to politics, to our knowledge of nature and the universe kind of all fell under the umbrella of religion, right? In the sense that we know the order of the universe because we have some relationship to the divine source of that order, and there are there's a certain institution, whether you know in the church in Europe that mediates uh, the the wisdom of this divine to the people, and so everything was sort of in this compact cosmology, as uh, I think uh, Eric Vogelin referred to it, compact cosmology, so that mm. the true, the good, and the beautiful, and the institutions associated with each have not been differentiated yet. Now we live in this modern period where everything's differentiated, even dissociated. Um, Ken Wilber likes to make that distinction. And science and the pursuit of the true has become totally disconnected uh, from you know, morality and, and uh, the practice of virtue um, and art has so totally severed itself from any sort of moral vision or religious vision. Or, or vision of truth, right? Everything is just, everyone's off doing their own thing. And so everything's fragmented. And, you know, the one of the consequences of that lack of coherence 
is um, it, it ramifies into our political and, and social lives because we don't know where to turn for authority. Um, because the problem with saying trust the scientists is that the scientists don't agree with each other. You know, as a as an interested um, someone interested in the history of science and and in contemporary science. When I want to learn about, say, quantum theory, I go in and I read the quantum physicists. And I don't know, there's like 15 or 20 different interpretations of quantum theory uh, out there. And maybe a few of them are more dominant. But in general, there's not much consensus about the truth, even within science, right? And so that's one problem. Um, but I think more broadly, the issue is, and, and this is where I think you and I could have an interesting conversation. We don't have any sort of integrative cosmological vision within which we could begin to make sense of just all of the special sciences, much less uh, art and religion and politics, you know, and these other facets of human existence. In the traditional sense, cosmology should integrate all of that. And, um, we're lacking that sort of integrative vision, though there, there are some, um, there are figures who have offered us hints in that direction, I think, and, and you know, whether that's um, coming out of German idealism or uh, figures like Alfred North Whitehead or, um, you know, someone like Merleau Ponty in his late work was starting to gesture towards this, a new philosophy of nature that would integrate all these fears. And so, um, yeah, I thought you and I could probably dig into this, the history here and look at some of the, um, maybe the, the live options for like getting back into cosmology in a way that's gonna be different from the ancient and medieval world, of course, uh, but nonetheless would still be striving for some, you know, non-reductive integrative vision that holds together what the sciences say, the natural sciences with you know, what I would call the hardcore common sense presuppositions of civilized human existence, things like, you know, free will and that consciousness is, uh, that consciousness connects us with reality in some way and isn't just an illusion. Like once we start doubting that, I think we're kind of pulling the rug out from under ourselves, but yeah. Yeah, uh, these are these are very, very interesting uh, and very good points. Um... So one thing that I would like to maybe touch upon here is um, um, there's this strong aversion among many of the, scient the sci scientists towards um, anything philosophical when it comes to science proper. So science is supposed to be somehow free uh, from everything that has to do met with metaphysics. Uh, if, we if we understand metaphysics in a very broad sense of the term uh, as, as some sort of a narrative or account of, uh, let's say, um, the ultimate reality, however broadly construed. So we don't really have to go into details at this point. But the main issue here is um, whenever this happens, whenever people tend to eschew this uh, metaphysical reasoning of any sorts, what tends to happen is that a lot of metaphysics is done, but in a bad way. So what happens is you get an implicit metaphysics. People philosophize, but they will not call, call it philosophizing because it's inappropriate in the context of the, of the discipline that you're working in. So for instance, contemporary uh, uh, physics, both in the field of the uh, micro, micro realm and macro realm is basically um, um, uh, um, permeated, flooded with different types of theories that are as baroque as some of the, uh, as some of the philosophical theories from the early modern era. So if you look at the, you know, the, 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 the classical authors from that era, Descartes, Leibniz, and so on and so forth, they've erected these grand metaphysical systems. And after Kant, uh, this was something that for philosophers has become a problem. You know, you cannot simply develop these uh, models of reality 
which can be completely at odds with one another because after a while you know you you just start you you, you can uh, start a- asking questions as to you know why is this one better than the other one so basically you lose any type of criteria and it would seem that you can just proliferate these types of models in into infinity and the thing is if you don't really if you're not really willing to um, acknowledge the fact that people are driven to philosophy, that people philosophize whenever they touch upon uh, certain fundamental questions, you will simply end up with uh, what is usually lousy metaphysics. And for example, when you have theories that talk about multiverses and uh, string theories and you know uh, talk of imaginary times and so on and so forth these are concepts that are not only not verifiable often um, they are often not even in principle uh, um, 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 open to to any type of let's say empirical verification so you get to a point where you basically create these edifices and I'm using plural here because there's many of them. Uh, and it is legitimate to do this as long as you're doing it in the context of physics, because then it's proper science. Why? Well, you have these mathematical models for it. You know? So one thing that should be pointed out here that um, contemporary physics is extremely and profoundly philosophical. The more it rejects philosophy, the more it claims it isn't, the more it is philosophical in a certain sense. And this shouldn't really surprise us because natural sciences, as we know them today, were originally, so in the 16th and 17th century, one of the possible philosophical projects that were out there a project that eventually turned out to be extremely, extremely efficient, that uh, has proven to be extremely beneficial and useful for many disciplines and for tackling many phenomena and many different uh, issues. But at the core of it, it was a philosophical project. Um, And the thing is, what was instituted in the 16th and 17th century was not necessarily so much a theory in the sense of having a a framework, theoretical frameworks that you can, a framework where you could simply uh, uh, boil it down to a determinate postulate. You know, you can explicate all the propositions of this particular theory. It was not that. It was more something like a, a specific thought style was created to use Ludwig Flick's term. Uh, I think that Whitehead uses uh, um, the, the, the term tone, a specific tone of thought, a specific tone of thinking. So uh, a specific way of thinking, looking at things and being in the world was erected. You know, it was a specific way of handling and dealing with phenomena, regardless of the nature of these particular phenomena. And a lot could be said about this. One prominent characteristic here was the idea that if you engage in the deconstruction of phenomena, you will eventually end up with uh, discrete constituents of these phenomena that you can comprehend clearly and that this is somehow uh, the only proper way to acquire knowledge in the strict sense of the term. So for example, that was one of the integral elements of this particular thought style that was erected there. It was present before, of course, but when this particular thought style was then combined with say developments in the fields of mathematics and then uh, um, uh, used to account for specific physical phenomena uh, um, uh, through Kepler and Galileo and Newton and so on and so forth, a specific way of approaching problems was created. And this um, was not only a manner, as I said, of thinking, but also a manner of seeing and also a manner of being in a certain sense. So what are your your thoughts on that? (laughs) 
Um, I think you've described this this new tone of thought quite well, and um, you know it, I'm, I'm reminded of what Whitehead says in um, Science in the Modern World, which I know you just uh, started uh, reading or rereading, and he he says. I think, he, I think he says in the year 1500, Europe knew less than Archimedes, uh, you know, almost 2000 years earlier about how nature works. By the year 1700, you know, Newton's published his Principia, the scientific, you know, Copernicus, Galileo, uh, Descartes, all of this new scientific work has been done and um, a new approach to understanding the natural world has been brought forth it's not that like Archimedes wasn't already taking a mechanistic view. It's that um, his view was more instrumental. Like, what can I do with this knowledge? Knowledge is know-how, right? And it was more of an engineering mentality. And Archimedes wasn't claiming to know the nature of nature. Something shifted after Copernicus where um, all of a the sudden these engineering models were taken to be metaphysically real, that this is actually how nature does it, right? So rather than, you know, as the Ptolemaic astronomers had been doing, trying to save the appearances in a more, with more humility and saying, look, we don't know how the divine does it, makes the heavens go around, but this model allows us to predict and, and, and have good calendars. And so we'll use this. But then after Copernicus put the sun at the center, there was this impulse to say, ah, we can we can actually understand how it really works. We can we can perceive nature uh, from God's perspective, as it were, right? And mathematics was was thought to be the language of the divine, and this it was a new metaphysics, really, um, not just a not just a, an instrumental method for engineering things, but uh, it was thought. Uh, as a thought to be a, a way of uh, understanding the truth of nature. But, and, and, and science therefore gradually separated itself from metaphysics and philosophy. Um, while it was initially, as, as you're saying, um, itself a form of natural philosophy by you know, the 19th century, science had been professionalized as an independent discipline. Scientists began to think of themselves as um, not philosophers anymore and they even don't even they don't need philosophy and that philosophy just gets in the way and whitehead describes this as a kind of anti-rationalistic reaction because you know in the medieval period um up to the time of descartes right there's this the weight of the scholastic tradition with all of its um sort of uh, labyrinthine logical reasoning, uh, trying to derive the structure of reality from uh, rules of logic uh, and inference and, 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 and the structure of uh, propositions. And the shift with the scientific revolution was an attempt to break free of all of that and to say, hey, we don't need to just read Aristotle, we can just do the experiments ourselves. And the claim was, you know, like Galileo would say, he was being more empirical he was looking at how things actually behave in the world. And to some extent that's true. Apparently Aristotle never thought to test his understanding of fallen bodies and Galileo ran some simple experiments and showed that uh, it doesn't matter what, what the, the weight of an object is, as long as the air resistance is the same, they'll fall at the same acceleration. Simple experiment that people didn't notice for 2000 plus years. But on the other hand, the way that Galileo thinks of the mechanics of the natural world is very abstract because to take out air resistance and friction in these things that are factors in the real world so that your mathematical model accurately predicts what's going to happen, it's, it's not as empirical as it seems because you're imagining an ideal situation. And yeah, gradually as, uh, as our ability to manufacture instruments improved, we could create technological instruments that provided a very fine degree of accuracy in our the, the measurements that we can make. And so we were able to abstract even further, you know, and, and from the simplest vacuum chambers that they had, you know, in, in the, the 16 and 1700s to particle accelerators now, it's like we can we can contort and twist nature's arm, so to speak, to get it to conform to our hypothetical models and make the measurements that 
prove or at least don't disconfirm uh, the models that, that we were putting forward. But all of this takes place in the absence of a kind of um, holistic ground for uh, understanding like the nature of um, the relationship between the human observer, uh, the, the epistemological problems that Kant pointed out haven't really been, I think, integrated. Otherwise, we wouldn't be a century on with quantum theory still trying to understand what it means. You know, like, so I think philosophy has so much to offer to the natural sciences, not as a critic of the science, maybe a critic of the implicit metaphysics, as you're saying, but in terms of um, better positioning the scientific knowledge that we do have within the context of a more holistic scheme uh, of concepts and categories, I think we need philosophy now more than ever uh, for that task. Um, and so, you know, I hope that uh, in the next decades that we'll see a shift away from all of these popular scientists, popularizers of science like Richard Dawkins or uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, I mean, I know mostly the Anglo-American ones. There's probably some in Europe too who do something similar, who proselytize for capital S science. And that would be one thing if they just did that, but they're constantly dragging philosophy down saying it's useless or worse than useless. And, um, you know, you hit on something important, which is that we have an instinct to philosophize as human beings, to ask metaphysical questions, and that's rooted in wonder. And there's a hubris that comes along with a certain conception of the authority of science, which says that science ultimately could explain away wonder. And even if you don't think that that's happened already, but you think that's some future ideal that could in principle be realized, I think that's a profoundly short-sighted view with, with dangerous social and political consequences because it suggests that there could in the future be a group of researchers that could arrive at the truth and that anyone who would deny that truth would be just some sort of regressive you know, romantic or something. And that truth should then be enforced on those people. And so you start to bleed into a kind of scientific fascism when you hold to that view. Um, because the problem is no matter how much empirical data we have, no matter how refined our instrumentation becomes and how much data we collect, those data will have patience for multiple theoretical interpretations, always, right? There's always more than one way to interpret the same set of data and, and that's never gonna change. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. Uh, so not only do you have um, an incredible amount of data available that can be interpreted in different ways, but what counts as data depends on the presuppositions that you already bring into the game. And these pre presuppositions are often even not necessarily very clearly articulated. So they might be implicit presuppositions. Um, so, uh, you see what you look for, or at least, um, in the manner or the way you, you, you look, you, you, you look at things. So, um, so there, there's definitely that. And I think that, um, this is something that I was, um, aiming at. So, um, the specific thought style that was introduced was basically um, it allowed thinkers to look at phenomena differently. It, it allowed to introduce certain novelties, certain ways of approaching phenomena that proved to be extremely, extremely productive in many different ways. And as Whitehead rightly points out this, how does he call it? I think he calls it something like a historical revolt uh, against the, against rationalism of the middle ages, 
And I think this is a very nice way of phrasing it, a very unorthodox way of phrasing it, because you know, usually middle ages are depicted as being profoundly irrational, whereas in fact, the, the predominant way of philosophizing back then was, if anything, hyper-rational. <laughs> so there was this break away from this and emphasis on, you know, you have to look into antecedents of a phenomena in order to be able to understand it. And by doing so, you introduce the notion of efficient causality and you um, water down or completely eliminate the importance of the final causality. Uh, and again, this emphasis on um, really breaking down phenomena into constituent elements and then getting clear determinant uh, atoms of one sort of another and another and trying to see how they interrelate among one another, um, claiming that this is what will ultimately bring you a clear and distinct understanding of a certain phenomenon. This was extremely, extremely useful. And I think that what often gets downplayed in uh, when, when we construe these different styles of thought is the metaphors that are being used in these specific thought styles. They're usually presented as some sort of additions. You know, you have like a, you, you have a, uh, you have a, a philosophical project of sorts. And then you have metaphors to kind of um, uh, depict or portray uh, this as plastically as possible. But often metaphors usually actually enable us to acquire a better feel for a particular thought style than necessarily specific postulates or explicate, uh, uh, so explicit, uh, um, explicit uh, propositions. Uh, about a certain theory and so on and so forth. And the ideas, so for example, metaphors in, in the classical science are well known. You know, clock would be such an example. You know, you have these complex mechanisms that are basically constructed of tinier elements and these tinier elements are interrelated in a very specific ways and you can describe these in interesting uh, mechanistic ways, causally, uh, so cause effect relations um, and you can formalize this, you can uh, mathematize this, uh, and this is how you basically acquire a clear and distinct, distinct knowledge of the structure of reality. And even people nowadays who might say, well, you know, these early mechanisms, they, they were basically wrong, they, they, they fail, fail to... Um, fail to see that very often there are still very much in the grips of this particular thought style. They would still subscribe if you kind of really um, um, push them against the wall, they would subscribe to some, some version of a clock type of, uh, of universe. Even though, and we can get to this a bit later on, even though, uh science itself by introducing certain notions notion, notions such as field for instance have already moved has already moved away from this image and what often happens is that you have specific notions and a specific thought style and they don't really fit nicely together so you have these old thought styles which are coag coagulated in these specific metaphors. And then you have new notions emerging at the very for forefront of science, at the very avant-garde of what science is doing. And you try to understand them somehow with this old thought style. And there is so much dissonance that you basically end up living in some sort of a schizophrenic world. And what, what happened uh, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century is that many of these authors uh, that you've mentioned, Whitehead, Merleau-Ponty, Gestalt psychologists, so Wertheimer, Köhler, Kofka, uh, um, Goldstein, Husserl, so many of these uh, uh, philosophers and scientists 
mind you, many of them were actually scientists, uh, have tried to develop new ways of thinking about phenomena, new ways uh, uh, of approaching phenomena. So keeping the rigor of science, but introducing new epistemological and methodological frameworks. So new ways of thinking about phenomena and new ways of tackling them, handling them. Um, yeah, and maybe we can uh, say a few words on these uh, about these new uh, about these new metaphors uh, and how they translate into uh, how we basically see phenomena on the very fundamental level. I have at least two interesting, I, I think, it, potentially interesting uh, metaphors of this sort or or examples of this sort. But maybe you can uh, add a little bit something before I get into that. Yeah, no, I really appreciate what you're, what you're saying by bringing in the importance of metaphor in the history of science. Um, I mean, the, the mechanistic metaphor obviously was dominant from um, the time of, of Descartes and then Newton up until um, the early 20th century when, when both quantum theory and relativity, relativity theory undermined the physical basis for that metaphor, where you would have simply located parts uh, in some kind of kind of absolute space, and uh, merely efficient causation could explain how those parts interact uh, and what the uh, the future uh, trajectories of all the particles in the universe would be. That understanding of the universe as some complicated machine made of um, simply located parts that are fully present at an instant. That's no longer the physical conception of science. Unfortunately, in biology, a lot of times in psychology and sociology, um, some forms of sociology at least, there's there's this mechanistic residue where there's still this assumption that ultimately all this must reduce down to these interactions of particles in a mechanistic way. Physicists still will talk in terms of particles, but they mean vibrations in the field. Um, and so there's a there's a there's a uh, delay I think in the um, the sort of um, propagation of this shift into the other sciences, which traditionally were thought to be um, stacked on top of physics and ultimately reducible to it. The question now becomes, in light of contemporary physics. Uh, what even would that foundation be that everything else is supposed to be reducible to? Whitehead said, I think in science in the modern world as well, he says, what's the point of talking about mechanics when you don't know what you mean by mechanics? Uh, because there's no sound basis for a mechanistic explanation in physics anymore. You know, so, but yet in biology, there's still this sense that if you're not offering a mechanistic explanation, you're not doing legitimate science. To talk about formal and final causality is still considered fringe, you know, and they the, the establishment puts you over with Rupert Sheldrake if you want to do that sort of thing, even though I think many biologists um, are starting to question that, but they want to continue to get published and get research funding. And as soon as you move away from, you know, anything but efficient causality, that all becomes um, threatened. And so there's a lot of institutional inertia, I think. Um, and nowadays, another new metaphor that seems at first a little less mechanistic because it's um, an information processing metaphor. And so it seems um, more ethereal in a way, but it's the computer metaphor, right? Uh, we don't talk about nature in terms of, you know, clocks or clockwork, and we've moved beyond the 19th century steam engine metaphor. So now we speak in terms of computation and, and computer processing. And it's a very powerful metaphor. But I think it's once you start to ontol it or hypostatize it or, or ontologize it, it becomes it breaks down. Um, and so I see a lot of that going on. And, you know, ideally, I think we would want a more organic metaphor because after all, uh, we ourselves are living organisms 
And all of these metaphors are produced by us. And, you know, they're, they're sort of excretions of our own consciousness, as it were. And so when we're thinking about um, the, the sort of, I mean, one way to think about it is the sort of epistemological um, um, presuppositions of uh, uh, doing science. We have to assume as a, um, uh, a premise that um, this universe, whatever it may be, is capable of producing living, intelligent organisms who can do science. And very often, the, reduction, the more reductionistic accounts of uh, consciousness um, don't, they, they undermine the very possibility of science, right? Because they don't allow for this universe to produce something like a conscious, living, intelligent organism. And so I think there's good epistemological reasons there uh, to make the organic metaphor uh, the basis upon which we search for scientific explanations of the universe. And once we adopt an organic metaphor, we no longer need to think of just independently existing parts that accidentally arrange themselves into more complicated patterns according to some arbitrarily imposed laws. We can instead think more in terms of historical development, evolutionary unfolding. Uh, and when you're speaking in terms of organism, then you can also speak in a naturalistic way about aim and purpose, imminent purpose, not purpose imposed from beyond, which when you, the traditional way of thinking of the laws of nature or the laws of physics, that's teleology. That's design imposed from beyond ultimately. And so in a more organic conception, we could see these laws as emerging as habits out of the interplay uh, of, of the organic beings that are composing the universe. So yeah, I, I think we would probably converge on this, this idea of, the or, or, of organism as, as the more um, suitable metaphor, but I'm, I'm curious to hear what, uh, mm. what you were, where you were gonna go a second ago. Yeah, I was uh, I was uh, basically thinking of um, trying to portray two two metaphors um, or ways of or new. I think this was the the phrase that was used by the physicist Bohm: templates of thought or templates of th seeing. Um, it would be something akin or similar to thought style or tone of thought, if you like. So um, if I'm too long, just, you know, kind of stop me and if you feel free to uh, intervene at any point. So the, fir the first uh, template, um, the first um, metaphor, if you like, is um, something that uh, was introduced or that was pointed out by gestalt psychologists and it's a uh, it's something that's very common something that's quite frequent uh, everybody who has uh had a course in in uh, psychology psychology one-on-one -on -one, say if they mention gestalt psychologists they probably uh also mentioned this heard heard about this so it's the it's the figure ground distinction um but the thing is these metaphors, these templates of thoughts abound, but usually what we don't do, we don't really reflect on them and we don't really try to get, get to their core. We don't really try to get, uh, spell out all the implications of these specific metaphors. So the figure ground basically um, is the idea in, in psychology, uh, um, at the end of the 19th century, when, when in Germany, uh, psychology was being transformed into science. So when, when psychology tried to become science, uh, one of the branches of the science, um, the idea was to basically um, take the Newtonian picture of the world, or I'm, I'm using the term Newtonian very loosely, maybe mechan mechanistic picture would be better, okay, because there's some dispute whether and to what degree Newton was in fact a, a, a mechanical philosopher. And there are 
probably good reasons to say that uh, he wasn't, or if he was, that you need to qualify this. But we don't really have to go into this. So to basically kind of introduce the conception, the mechanical picture, you know, discrete elements that are causally interrelated or somehow po passively interrelated into uh, our mental realm, so into the realm of consciousness and experience. And the main idea was that our experience, our experiential realm consists of these sense data, which are mental atoms of sort, and that they um, get interrelated through these specific laws of, asso uh, of association. And you can study those. And these are laws that are very similar to laws that you would find in nature, according to the classical picture. And uh, quite a lot of work has been done under um, this premise, but um, Gestalt psychologists question this, and they basically claim that if you look at the very structure of experience, what you get is a very different picture, a very different dynamics. Namely, whenever you see something, anything in your uh, say, visual field, you will see a certain something as a figure. So what I focus on, what I see clearly and determinately is a figure. So in this case, this, this would be a, this particular cup or mug. Yeah. But at the same time, other segments of my visual field, uh, we draw into the background. And they are there. It's not nothingness there. It's not just one atom and nothingness, but it's, it's a certain something that has a specific structure, a specific dynamics, but it's indeterminate. It has a different structure. Now, you might say, of course, this is trivial. What the heck are you on about? Why, why are you making a you know, uh, big deal out of this? Well, because the point here is whenever you get a certain something, you need to have a specific context for this something to be this something. So you need a certain indeterminate context for you to have a certain determinate something. Of course, you can disregard this context if you want, but you're not really being paying attention to the structure of your experience because your experience as a field is structured in such a way that whenever you have a certain determinate figure, a certain de determinate form, you also have a specific indeterminate background. And these dynamics, so you basically have a, an interesting dynamic where you need the figure, uh, you, when you, where you need the background in order for you to have a figure and you need a figure for you to be able to talk about the, uh, the, the, the background. So basically what you have here is, you know, this, uh, um, important uh, emphasis on the contextuality of anything that is given. So what appears, appears in a given context, appears against a given horizon, a given ba background. But there's another point to this, and this I find extremely interesting. And this is something that Merleau-Ponty uh, emphasized. So I'm looking at a certain something at this mug, and I see a certain uh, figure against a certain background. Yeah, but there's another background that's implicitly present, but I, but I even more often overlook. And that's the background of my bodily attitude towards this. So for me, so what I see as a figure and what I see as a ground depends on how I situate myself in relation to this figure and this ground. So my bodily poise, the way I situate myself, the way I structure myself as a living being, as a living body, correlates to what is given in my experience as a figure and a ground. So basically, there is an interesting equivalence between my bodily position and what is given as an experience. So this is one figure, okay? And now moving to the second figure, and then I'll try to, or, or, or one metaphor, uh, and then I'll, uh, moving on to the second metaphor, and then I'll try to just kind of uh, spell out some implications of this. And then I would be really, really interested in hearing what you have to say about all of this. Now, another metaphor, and this was the metaphor that was commonly used by people who were 
critiquing uh, the mm, um, mechanistic thought style was the metaphor or mel of melody or music. So this is very interesting because for several reasons, I'll try to portray this as uh, organically as possible. So if you sound two notes individually, and if you sound them together, what you get if you sound them together is not merely the sum of what you get if you sound them individually. As soon as they sound, if you sound them together, they constitute a whole, and in this whole, they become aspects with specific quality, value, and dynamics that differs from the, the qualities and dynamics and values they would have in different holes. So the same note in different holes has a different quality, different structure, and a different dynamic. So that's one thing. As soon as you have something that is that you might call as a very simple melody, you get a whole which determines the nature and the relationship, relationships and qualities of its constituents. So it's not like you just have these uh, um, uh, discrete elements that you put together and they somehow form a, a, a summation of sorts. So a summative whole. What you get is a dynamic whole that basically uh, has a very different unity and in this regard, uh, determines different qualities of its aspects uh, than th these, uh, these uh, segments would have in isolation. But there's another twist to this story. Say you sound two notes one after another. So not only do you get a whole, you get a whole which has a specific dynamics, but as soon as you do this, this whole calls for a specific resolution. So, uh, you know, if I sound two or three notes, I can then end up melod a specific melody only in a specific way. Now, the, it's not just one way that's possible. There are several, but they are not contingent. So it's not like you can do anything you want. Not anything goes. So you have three melodies which kind of open up a horizon of possible resolutions if you want this to unfold into something that is harmonious. So this is very interesting. Why? Because you have three notes, for instance, one after another. They constitute a dynamic whole, and this whole creates a specific polarity some sort of intentionality that shows you what are the possible resolutions in advance. So there is a certain polarity, a certain um, intentionality, if you like, that you know, uh, uh, allows only for specific developments of this dynamic whole. If it is to be a whole, you know, uh, and, and not fall apart. So. Um, what you get in a certain sense, and you know, one might say whether this is uh, just metaphorically speaking or not, you get some sort of a, a, a insight, interiority, because there is a polarity from within which determines possible resolutions and how this will unfold. So if we take these two, two metaphors, okay? The first one is figure ground and then uh, uh, me as an observer as another ground and the, the example of music. What kind of a thought style does this depict? What kind of a, a thought style does this translate into? Well, one thing which differs from the classical point of view is the importance of the observer. Figure ground. So it is how I position myself with regards to something that will determine what I will see as a figure and what I will, if I so want, if I, if I choose to do so, will ignore as irrelevant ground. However, this ground is there. I can pretend that it isn't because it, it is easier for, for my manipulation of the phenomena and doing specific calculations. But what is important, important, important is that what is given as seemingly individual, isolated, discrete, uh, self-subsisting something is basically correlated with my interference with the world of phenomena. That's one thing. Another thing is, if we look at 
um, both this example and even more so the example of the melody, you don't really have to do with discrete individual atoms or constituent elements. What you have to do is what, what, uh, what you're faced with is dynamic holes. So this dynamism, dynamism, that the, 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 the reality is not static and movement is not merely a correlation between static constituents of reality, but that, that you have to be able to think about reality as something that is intrinsically dynamic. So not something where movement and processuality is simply added atop of the static reality, but being able to think dynamic phenomena. Then third thing, and this one I think is very interesting. Usually in the context of science, if something is indeterminate, it is either nothing or it is a thing. So what you have to do is you have to meddle with this indeterminate phenomenon and you have to figure out whether it actually is something or it's maybe just a mirage. It's some sort of a mistake. But in this particular image that I've presented, the, the figure ground, indeterminate is constitutive of determinate. If you want to have a certain determinate something, you need an indeterminate background. And again, for practical reasons, you can choose to ignore it. But as a matter of fact, it is there and it is indeterminate. It cannot be determinate. As soon as you make it determinate, something else has to become indeterminate. So you have the figure ground dynamics and indeterminate. What is important is it has to be recognized as a positive phenomenon. What do I mean by that? You have to be able to include it into your epistemology without reducing it either to nothing or to something. So indeterminate as, as the domain of possibility of domain of virtuality is something that is actually crucial if you really have to have, if you want to have determinate knowledge of something. And two final things, and then I'll finish. The emphasis on the systemic or organizational aspect. So, you know, both, as, uh, both uh, uh, metaphors, uh, both templates speak about the importance of systems, of unities, of wholes. And again, these systems, these organizations are not merely add-ons. It's not like you have these constituents and now you merely have to figure out how they fit together and how they interrelate and you get wholes. No, no, no. Once you get a specific... Uh, uh, um, specific amount of say um, uh, segments of any sort, they will constitute a certain configuration which will start behaving as a system, which will start behaving as a whole. And once this happens, the system will in a certain sense delimit its potential uh, um, behavioral spaces. So how it will behave and in which ways it can and will be able to move. And this is something that the system as a whole will determine uh, in, in a dynamic fashion. So this, this emphasis on organizations and uh, organization and systems in general. And then finally, what you said, some sort of an internal purposiveness. As I've said, once you have three notes, once you have a, a very rudimentary melody, what you get is a tension, a propulsion. You have a specific um, polarity that enables specific ways of behaving and specific ways of resolving the tension that has been created. And only these specific ways are allowed or permissible if this dynamic whole is to retain its unity. So you have two metaphors, which are extremely, which are pregnant with interesting implications, and they don't necessarily have to spell into something that would uh, eschew science as such. Quite the contrary, you can, you can provide interesting synthesis between these types of metaphors and their implications with the rigor of science. That's beautiful. Um, you know, I, I kept thinking of uh, uh, Bergson when, when you were speaking and the distinction he makes between uh, 
scientific intellect on the one hand and philosophical intuition on the other hand, where intellect tends to spatialize the universe it, and, and spatializes time, uh, importantly, um, which leads to this conception of um, if it talks about holes at all, it's always a, um, a spatial hole where the parts merely add up to and sum to some larger whole. And what you're talking about is a kind of musical ontology, which is incidentally what um, one of Whitehead's students, uh, Suzanne Langer, uh, who studied with Whitehead at Radcliffe, he would go lecture to the women at Radcliffe when he was done at Harvard. And she described Whitehead's ontology as musical in this sense, in exactly the way that you're saying that he's describing, and Bergson in his own way, not spatial wholeness, but temporal wholeness, a dynamic uh, wholeness that's not merely additive where parts sum to a whole, that's not anything more than just the sum of its parts. It's a cumulative wholeness or a dynamic wholeness, which as you were saying, each note as you approach the resolution of a melody, it, it leaves, when you're only halfway through the melody, there's a potential that's generated that calls or lures you towards its resolution. And so there's an aim implicit in this notion of a dynamic or, or temporal wholeness. And that's right at the core of um, the process relational ontology that, that Whitehead was working through um, in, his, you know, in, in his philosophy and that, and that Bergson in his own way was working through. And so it allows us to bring aim back into nature because we're understanding nature not in an abstract intellectual way as a spatialized collection of objects, but we, 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 we are able to perceive it from within as it were on the basis of our own um, stream of consciousness or, or duration as, as Bergson would say. And, and we can understand from the inside out how causality itself unfolds in nature. And, and we can understand something like formal and final causality in this aesthetic way just as we understand how music unfolds. Um, and then what, you know, what you're saying about the Gestalt um, psychologists and their analysis of perception, um, I haven't studied them very, very deeply, but there are profound resonances with, with Whitehead. Um, you know, he'll say things like that every, every finite proposition presupposes a systematic metaphysical background. And so we might think we're saying something um, definite and yet in a halo around that is this background that is infinite, that uh, is somehow our finite proposition is implying all of that. We might not even be conscious of it, but it's implied. Um, he says in one of his essays, um, he says, in our experience, there is always the dim background from which we derive and to which we return we are not enjoying a limited doll's house of clear and distinct things secluded from all ambiguity. In the darkness beyond, there ever looms the vague mass, which is the universe begetting us. So I, you know, I thought immediately of that as you were describing um, the ground that every figure presupposes, right? Um, and then in this critique of sensory atomism and the associationist paradigm, um, Whitehead has this lovely line from, um, I think it's from Modes of Thought, where he says, uh, a young man does not initiate his experience by dancing with impressions of sensation and then proceed to conjecture a partner. His experience takes the converse route. Uh, the true physical doctrine is that physical feelings are in their origin vectors. And this is, that would, to unpack that would get a lot too much into Whitehead's scheme. And uh, unfortunately, I need to run to my next call in a minute here. But um, what you're saying about the primacy of the body, as in, you know, Marilu Ponti's embodied phenomenology, Whitehead says the same thing that, you know, our the primary datum of our perception is the feeling of the body as functioning. And we don't often notice that primary datum. We don't, we don't feel our eyes, we don't feel our eardrums. We see with our eyes, we hear with our ears. And so the medium is transparent unless we're injured. Uh, and, and Whitehead has this whole sort of uh, 
almost Heideggerian analysis of, of our sensory organs. You know, when Heidegger talks about a tool breaking and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, we become aware of the difference between, um, you know, presence to hand and readiness to hand and so on. Whitehead says something similar about our senses and his brilliant analysis of Hume, you know, maybe one of the most prominent sensory atomists and associationists where Hume's denying that we have any empirical evidence of causation and yet repeatedly says that we see with our eyes, we hear with our ears, uh, we see with our eyes, that's causation right there. It's right in, in right under your nose, <laughs> or right above it, as it were. Um, and so, yeah, that, I had so much resonance with what you're saying. And I, I, I love the um, convergence from a, you know, a school of thought that I'm not as familiar with that's articulating some of the things that are core features of, of Whitehead's metaphysics um, from this gestalt psychological angle. Yeah, and uh, one other thing that uh, this is, yeah, this is precisely, I mean, the, I haven't read that much. Um, I'm not, not that well versed in, in Whitehead, but I've, uh, I've read uh, first third of the uh, mode is it modes of thought before he gets into the the space and time analysis and then i was just he, he lost me yeah. uh, <laughs> and i read science and the modern world and that's the one i'm rereading and yeah the, for sure you know whenever i read him that there's so many strong resonances with what merleau-ponty is doing it's just incredible it's right I mean, th this needs to be explored further for sure. I mean, there's so much wealth in this. Um, uh, but anyway, what I wanted to say, given the fact that you will have to go soon, um, is that what we were talking about is not something, and I think this is important to underscore and underlie, that it's not something that would be in opposition with science. Say, the, the development in the field of so-called dynamic systems theory mm -hmm. uh, and has developed mathematical tools that are able to model such complex systems. Systems that cannot be deconstructed in the classical way. But actually, uh, so, you know, you have these uh, linear, nonlinear systems and so on and so forth. We, we really don't have to go into this at this point. But the, the, the thing is that there are interesting mathematical tools and also, you know, specific scientific uh, notions, such as the one that we talked about, uh, that we mentioned on several occasions, um, and that was also used, for instance, by, by Gestalt psychologists, by, by Merleau-Ponty, the notion of field and uh, uh, the, 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 the very different way of thinking about phenomena it brings to the table. So there, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of work in contemporary science that is um, strongly aligned with some of the things that we were talking about. I would say two things, so, so as to end on a, on, a, on a positive note. So two things. One thing is, it is really important for science to just recognize and acknowledge that it philosophizes. It's not a big deal, <laughs> just say it, because you're doing it anyway. I mean, you can pretend this is not philosophizing. You don't have to call it by this name, but we all know Shakespeare and Rose, and you know, it will. It, it by any other name, it will. It will smell just as sweet. So, it's the same here. So you know, just uh, it is. It is um, the the reason for the reason for this is. There is basically, you know, at the very bottom of everything is basically the realm of human existence and experience. Human being being embedded into nature, reality, what have you. Eventually, through these different ways of coping with reality, different disciplines have developed and emerged. And at a certain point, a, a certain approach called science was 
for, for very pragmatic reasons and also for specific political and social reasons separated from philosophy. And then within science, you know, you got these new subdisciplines and so on and so forth. The problem is that after a while, people seem to forget this and they just kind of think that this is the way the reality is somehow divided or that people within a certain framework are doing something completely different from somebody else. This is not the case, you know? Science and philosophy are deeply and profound, so, so uh, principally intermeshed. They're basically both, in a certain sense, manifestations of our existence. And as such, they, they are uh, uh, specific structurations of the sphere of lived experience, whatever that means at this point. So this is something that needs to be acknowledged and recognized. That's one thing. And another thing is basically that I think that there are, and some of this has already been underway now. So there are very, very fertile fields um, that can be explored together. <laughs> so, you know, that there are, there are so many interesting ideas, metaphors, uh, conceptual frameworks that have been explore, uh, developed either in the field of science or in the field of philosophy. And there are so many congruences between these um, fragmented approaches often, you know? Um, so I think that this is the, the, the key point. So first of all, realizing that you cannot, in a certain sense, avoid philosophizing. It is, it is basically embedded into your existence as such. And science, this is very important. This is why I was emphasizing this. Started off and still is a philosophical project, a very specific philosophical project that has been extremely, extremely prolific and very, very useful, but a philosophical project nonetheless. So it, ha it has acquired, it, so it, it rests on specific presuppositions, on specific postulates. Why not talk about them? This does not necessarily have to translate into the death of science. It is not, as we said at the beginning, either evolution or creationism, either pro-science or anti-vaccine, not job, crazy, alien people, lizards coming and, you know, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> pick, your, uh, pick your bizarre theory of choice. So, you know, that, that we really have to kind of forego this dichotomous way of, and I don't really want to si sound all hippie-like or whatnot, but, you know, this <laughs> dichotomous way of, of fra framing problems and approaches is really not beneficial. Because the most interesting stuff usually happens is the, in the gray, indeterminate, indeterminate zone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm glad that you wanted to end on that note because we've been a bit critical of science, particularly the capital S science, right? The caricature of science that sometimes popularizers of science will fall prey to. Um, but I think both of us actually want to contribute to the sciences and want to, uh, as philosophers, advance our understanding of nature, utilizing the best of the scientific method and all of the data that's been accumulated is it really, we need um, more creative interpretations of it that do justice to those aspects of um, human embodiment and human experience that have been sidelined because of um, a, particular uh, form of science that has become ascendant. And I think that form of science, which has a more engineering technological bent to it has become ascendant because of our political economy, because that's where the funding is. And the way that modern universities have um, created these disciplinary silos because of, a, a, as a consequence of professionalization, like all these things get backgrounded when we just talk about capital S science and it's capital K knowledge of capital N nature. And it's like, we need to see science as a process, as something that's ongoing and open-ended and that there's, I have no doubt that many of the things 
that we take for granted as scientifically true now will go the way of phlogiston and the ether and all these other things because that's the nature of how knowledge unfolds in an evolutionary universe. Uh, and so we have to, I think, forego the original sense of certainty that came along with the Cartesian form of scientific inquiry and, and accept that um, the universe is an ongoing process. Our knowledge is part of that process. And we can think of our activity as converging upon truth, but we need to make sure that that asymptote is infinite because if we ever think we've arrived at truth, um, I think dangerous political and social consequences would follow from that. And we're very close to that sort of a situation now because of these extremes you're talking about. You know, the people who are like, ah, trust the authority of science and the people who are saying, I don't trust any authority because you know, we've been lied to so many times, blah, blah, blah. We're, we're tearing apart at the seams and moving to these extremes and neither one of them has a happy ending. So we need to stay in that gray area. I, I really appreciate the way you were framing that. Yeah, and I think that this is very pertinent in contemporary times with the, with the new culture war that is currently taking place. So, uh, it, it, it is definitely something that is not related strictly and only to science as such, but has way, way greater implications. However, science, as you mentioned at the very beginning of our talk, uh, of our discussion, uh, is a, a key player in this story because of the pandemic setting or pandemic background. Anyway. <clears throat> that was great, Seb. Thank you for, uh, for the conversation.